Состязание. По каким правилам будем драться? У нас нет правил. Martial arts did you practice and why did you choose exactly this martial arts? Uh, I started off as, as a young boy in Taekwondo and then I moved uh, into Huangdo, which is two traditional arts. After the, uh, I got my first degree black belt in Huangdo, uh, I was in law enforcement. Um, I, studied, I studied the uh, law enforcement defensive tactics and I was an instructor in nationally, nationwide, um, and locally with uh, law enforcement. Um, and then I started to get into the combative area where it was uh, a little less, it was much less traditional. Um, there was no real belt ranking system. Um, we dressed in regular street clothes and we did everything that any type of defense or offensive issues that we would encounter, we would do it in regular street clothes instead of a gi with a belt on. So it was, to me, it was what I was doing in law enforcement. It was more realistic for me. Uh, so I, I really liked that. So I started studying deeper into the combatives and, and Krav Maga, the Israeli uh, military style um, self-defense. John, can you share what system do you practice and what system do you teach your students? My system is called Combat Krav Maga. It's a system that I've taken uh, over my, it's my own system uh, that I've developed over my years of training where I have kind of like Bruce Lee did, uh, I've taken everything that I've learned, I've thrown out what is pretty much not useful to me or in useful in the real world. And I've kept everything else. I've, I've put everything in a curriculum, in a system, and that's what I teach. So it's, it's a recognized program worldwide uh, through the uh, Soki ship. And, and um, you know, with that and my uh, Black Belt Instructor of the Year through Black Belt Magazine, uh, it's been recognized. So how do you think? Can the person protect himself against the knife attack empty-handed? I think they can. Um, what I teach, first off, okay, with someone who has a knife is, or maybe I don't know he has a knife, I always want to see their hands. Okay, I always instruct my students, people I talk to at seminars that I do, that I want to be able to see your hands. Um, if I can't see your hands, then I'm going to have to keep some distance. Meaning, if, if I'm in a room, in a, like a square box with only one exit, you have the knife. And that room behind you, that I see behind you, is my only exit. Then I better have some type of a skill to be able to defend myself, to get past you, an exit. So I believe that the student or the person who wants to learn how to defend themselves empty-handed against a knife, one, has to be aware. That's the first thing. We have to be aware of our surroundings. I have to be aware of you and I have to be able to see your hands. The other thing is if it's you and I, and you have a knife coming against me, I do have to have some type of plan, some type of skill in order to defend myself. Uh, 
those skills or those that plan that I have doesn't necessarily have to be anything that's very martial arty. Okay, mm -hmm. it can be something that is. I pick up an improvised weapon. I have a cup of coffee here. Mm -hmm. I throw the hot coffee at you. I put something in between you and I, a table, uh, a vehicle, whatever I can get into, to buy time and space. I also instruct my students that their voice, to be able to yell, to bring attention to the situation. That's all before anything happens actually with the blade. Now, when the attack happens, yes, you have you have to have some type of a skill. Okay, you have to have uh, whether it's it's blocking, parrying, uh, angles, movement, uh, trapping, you know these types of things. But you have to you have to train very hard in these in these sections, and you have to have that mindset. I'm big on the mindset in my training of being able to unleash the violence that I would have to put on someone that's coming at me with violence. You understand? Yes. So, you know, now we enter into the blade is displayed and I'm being threatened. And a lot of times it doesn't happen that way. The blade comes out and it's this type of attack or it's this type of attack and we see it a lot of times a lot of times edged weapon attacks are never seen by the victim so again I rewind and go back to I need to be aware of my surroundings I need to be aware of you and what you're doing with your hands so now the, the blade is presented I see it can I escape Okay, if I can escape, me, with the amount of time I've had doing these types of things, I want to escape. I don't want to engage you. Mm -hmm. okay? So if I can escape, I do so. But like I said earlier, if I'm in a box, and it's you and I, and my only way out is behind you, to that doorway, then I better know something. So then we get into... It, with me, we get into training how to trap and how to end that very violently. Because I take it personal, um, and it should be taken personally, where someone attacks you with a knife, they're going to try to take your life. They're not going to do anything else with that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's uh, I take it personally, so when I react to it, uh, it's with violence, so I can end it quickly and be able to get home safely. John, you said that person has to be very skilled to protect himself against the knife attack. But we know there are a lot of different cases when person uh, that's not prepared met somebody with a knife and he survived in this situation. How do you think? Why does it happen? Absolutely. There's many black belts out on the street who become victims, right? Doesn't mean because you have a black belt, you know everything. There's more people who defend themselves on the street with, without a black belt, with very little knowledge, than there are people who are in the martial arts or in the combatives area. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. There, there are people out there who can react and be able to defend themselves with no skill. They're, you know, they, they got lucky, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they were aware, maybe their awareness. So I think that uh, that's a big part of it. You know, you don't necessarily have to be a, a big martial artist in order to, you know, or a highly skilled individual to be able to defend yourself against this. But you have to be aware. You have to be able to intercept. And in order to intercept, you have to see it. So it's a thing where those people that are out there defending themselves out in the street that have no skill, okay, there's something there that they do have that 
gives them that little bit of an edge over the more common person. Mm -hmm. And that's the will to survive. Mm -hmm. You know, the will to, to, to fight. Something that you cannot necessarily teach to people. You know, I talk to people all the time about the violence of encounters out on the streets and in explaining some of the things that happen out on the street, I get people looking at me where they're kind of like staring right through me that they, and they don't understand what can happen out there. So the average person that's out there and they're able to defend themselves with the knife, that's great. All right, but they have something inside them that says, I'm not going to be a victim. I'm going home. Can you share, how do you teach this mindset? Right. I, it's, it's not easy to teach people. It's, you have to, the average person, your average person in the Ukraine, is it easy to teach them how to defend themselves and how to have that mindset? Here in the United States, it's probably the same. It's not that easy. You have to have some type of will but when you step into the studio off the street to learn, you have to have a reason. Many people come in to my school and they, they, you know, I always ask, why do you want to train with me? Well, I had this happen to me. I had that happen to me. Uh, most, most people have never had anybody come in and say, well, I need, just need to be someplace at six o'clock in the evening for an hour. Okay. Usually most people who come train with me have a reason to be here. We look at the way the world is right now. And, and I, I try to explain to my students that you have to have the survival mindset for, to protect yourself, to protect your family. And it's, you know, because of the way the world's going, if you don't have that mindset to protect yourself, who else does? So it's trying to get across to them that when they come into the school, whether it be my school, your school, wherever it may be, you have to have that, that willingness to train hard and to be able to have that mindset of survival. You have children? No. Okay. You have family. Mm, sure. <laughs> All right. So you want to go home to them tonight, right? Yes. So this is the way I try to explain to people. When you leave wherever you are and you go home, then you have to get from one place to the other and an attack happens. You have to have a reason why you want to survive that. Usually family. You know, so I try to get into people's heads psychologically with trying to get them to understand that it's a violent encounter and that they have to turn on the violence. So getting them in that mindset, especially people who have never ever had anything happen to them, it's a difficult thing to do to get in here with them. So what do I do? I teach lessons. I put them in situations, in scenario type situations. Mm -hmm. We use we use marking blades. I put white t-shirts on people and we do drills, simple drills with the knife, just to show them that they're going to get cut, they're going to get stabbed, and then we start to raise the intensity. And over a period of time, Sometimes, not all the time, sometimes I can see the change in the people. Mm -hmm. you know? And once I see that, then I know I'm, I'm doing good with them. John, you already mentioned some certain drills that train psychological side of the person. Can you share more about this? I show them videos. I'll have a class in, in one section of my school and I'll put together a presentation and class that day or that night isn't necessarily going to be on the mat, but it'll be in the classroom. And we'll discuss the, 
the knife, knife attacks, edged weapons, because it doesn't necessarily have to be a knife. But I sit and, I, and I'll make a presentation. I'll insert a violent knife attacks. And I'll show these to people. I'll show them, you know, uh, photographs of victims who have been slashed or stabbed and they're in the hospital or they went to the morgue. And we discuss this. And, and I, sh I show them this because I want to see the look on their face when they, when they watch this. Because to, to most people, it's shocking. I've seen a lot of things like that in my, in my personal life. So it's a thing where some of these people come in, they've never seen anything like that before. So I try to hit home with them on that side of it with, with video and with uh, still shots of victims and what can happen to them. What school of bladed weapon is the most dangerous one in the world? I think the 12-year-old that I take a steak knife and put it in his hand and I teach him how to make a very rapid, violent X and chase people around the room is very dangerous. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, all your Filipino martial arts are great. Arnis, Eskrima, uh, Kali, all of them are great. Very technical. A lot of years put in to learn what you're doing. But I can take a 12-year-old boy, put a, a knife in his hand, and tell him how to make an X. A one, a two, a three, a four, and then put him in a shopping mall and tell him, go ahead, do your thing, for real. And that can be very violent, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's a very unskilled person. I could, I could teach him that in a matter of 10 minutes. Now, the people in the traditional arts, the Filipino martial arts, yeah, I'll give them credit. It's, it's a, they're great uh, people to learn the knife, the way of the knife. A lot of people that I've come across don't have that much time to put into the traditional arts. Mm -hmm. So they come into a combative section like I teach to learn how to maneuver the blade, how to defend against it. But because they don't have the years and the time to put in at the very beginning. But I like, I like Kali. I like what they do. Uh, I think it's, it's very intricate, it's a beautiful art, it's a very dangerous art. John, can you tell me please, have you ever been in such situation when you met somebody with a knife and you had to protect yourself? Yes. Can you share? I've been not, I was working, I was um, approached rapidly by someone and I backed away from them and I fell over a... Uh, how do I say it? A, a sprinkler head. Mm -hmm. In the grass, the water comes out. I fell backwards. He got on top of me. I jumped on top of me. Uh, I learned. I learned a long time ago how to defend myself from that position, and I was able to escape from that position un unscathed. Uh, but he did have a knife with him, and I was lucky. I was very lucky. I got away. This is very interesting to listen to such cases because uh, I know that you are a very experienced person and the real situations, they are different from the gym. And, and that's the thing, that's what I try to bring in to my students all the time, uh, bring in the reality of some of the experiences I've had in, in different things in my life in law enforcement. Uh, I did 28 years in law enforcement, uh, 16 of them was uh, with SWAT team. So I have a lot of various experiences that I've gone through that I can present to the student base. Can you share please what tactics and strategy can person use against the knife in case he is empty handed? Someone has approached, has approached me and they present a knife. First thing I'm going to do is make space. I'm going to get something in between me and him, depending upon you know where I am at the time. Uh, I have to separate him from me by either putting a desk, a vehicle, 
in between us to gain space, to keep me safe, and to buy some time. Okay, and to buy time, I mean I need to think about what I'm going to do next. If I have the opportunity, I'll, I will run. I will escape. I have not. I'm not the type of guy that, that if I have a chance to run, I'm gone. I'm not going to stay there and do some fancy uh, Bruce Lee stuff. I'm going to. I'm going to escape. If I can't escape, then I have to. Then I have to do something. Okay, in order to defend myself. So that's what I said earlier. If I have improvised weapons, if I have something to pick up and throw at him, to hit him with, um, to block the, the attack, then, then I will use those instruments, those types of implements, to be able to defend and, and keep him away from me. If I have nothing, then I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to go into what I know as far as defending against the blade. I hope for the best, because as, as you know from all your other interviews and things that you've done, nobody gets away unscathed <laughs> in a knife attack. It's it's just going to be very messy and and very violent. When it comes down to it, uh, you need to be somewhat athletic. Okay, I used to train with uh, Paul Bunak. Uh, in Jeet Kune Do, and out of Los Angeles, California, and he said, if I'm, he says to me, he says, John, we're standing in a handball court. You have a wall on both sides of you and a wall behind you, and I'm standing in front of you, and the only way you can get away is through past me, and I have a knife in my hand. One, you need to be, have some type of athletic prowess to be able to move around, okay? And also some type of defensive technique to be able to defend yourself from it. And, and to be able to make that space and be able to escape. So, so, you know, first thing I tell people, if you can, run, get out of there. Mm -hmm. If you can't and you need to put something between you, look at your where you are. In an office, I put a desk between us. Out in the parking lot by my vehicle, I put the car between us. Something as simple as a tree, a big tree that might be, you know, to, to keep him away from me. Picking up things to throw at him, to divert his, his uh, attention so I can escape. But if I can't escape, then I need to be somewhat athletic and have some type of defensive measure. John, can you do demonstration? For example, you met somebody on the street with a knife and you are empty-handed. How you can protect yourself? It's a millisecond where he is, okay? It could be a number five, it could be a number one slash, number two slash, okay? So for me, the way I teach this, as soon as I see that, I make space. If we're talking, okay, I see one hand, can't see the other. I have to be concerned about this. Immediately, I make space. Okay? But if I'm not paying attention to this, and his hand is behind his back, like it is, and he comes and he slashes at me, let's say another one slash, okay? All I'm going to do is basic colleague footwork, angles, okay? Uh, three things I'm going to do. I'm going to angle. I'm going to strike. Okay? So, as he slashes, I'm here and I strike. And then I crash and I lock in. Now from here, see, I need to lock this in very tightly because he's going to automatically be very, he's going to turn defensive now. He's going to try to pull his hand out. If I'm very lazy and I just grab and he, he pulls, I'm cut. So it's angle, strike, and bring it in. Now from here, my hand grabs above the elbow. This is here. Now I work my low line attack to the groin. Okay? His shoulder is right here. I can bite. I headbutt. Okay? Groins. Bite. If I need to take him down, I just 
the step. Take it down here. I go and mark from here. I know you probably can't see that. All right, but it's a, it's a very easy motion. There you go. Okay. So it's one here and here. It's got to be very quick because he's, he's not going to just martial arts way of one lazy slash. So he comes in when you come in, I'll just slash him and try to pull away. Okay, so here, here, and I trap and I hold on. Mm -hmm. Now that's going to work in hard from here. Okay? If he comes with a number two, take this angle here. A backhand, okay? It's the same type of motion. It's here, we're right there, and then I lock in here. Now here, I can break the arm. I work his legs. Then from here, I can rotate him down, take him down to the ground. If I have an overhand attack, an ice pick style attack, as he comes over, okay, we look at this first, as he, as he comes in, okay, and he comes in, he's going to either have to face the clavicle or my upper chest area. So I have to do what we call attack the attacker. He's attacking me. I have to automatically switch on. I catch him right here. And I try to grip the shoulder. I have an option. I can take him down at this arm. Or I can tear his shoulder. I prefer to tear the shoulder. Because it's really, this is, he's attacking me with a, a knife. This is not a motion. Okay? So as he comes in, I'm right here and I catch him here. Mm -hmm. So I have this lock right here. My left elbow is locked down, and then I rip the shoulder. Okay? Okay. On a number five attack, straight in stab. Right? Coming uh, from some of my formal background, Jeet Kune Do um, and Morongo, as he's here, as he, as he steps to stick me, the knife is an extension of the hand, do you agree? Yes. As he steps in, okay, and if I don't move, bad things will happen. So as he steps in, I fight to just give me that much more room, and then from here, I pass, and then I trap, and then I can go in and start working the body and go for takedowns if I need to. Okay? So once again, he steps in hard, I pass, and I wrap, and I start working my, my defensive technique. Depending upon my environment, maybe you and I are out, and you're standing here. You're not going to appreciate me passing the knife over that way, right? So, or I don't know your skill. Maybe if I do that, you'll do something else, right? So, as he does this, I can pass the opposite side. I have to know I'm a big proponent of understanding how to do things both sides of the body. So that feels very, very important. I don't want any of my students to get caught and hesitate because they don't know, they know one side but they don't know the other. We have some things on the ground that we do where a person is sitting on top of me in a mounted position and we, can, we do drills from there also. Usually this will start, see it's a bad position for a police officer, this is a very bad position to be in. Because he is blocking all of my tools. I cannot get to my, my firearm. I cannot get to my pepper spray. I can't get to anything because his legs are blocking. Okay? Usually this is going to start with hands. So he's going to start just beating me with his fists. So I have to block as he starts coming in. Okay? And it's all angles. It's straight down. It's hooking. Okay? And I get wrapped up into that, and before
before I know it, the knife comes out. And I don't even realize it probably until the second or third strike. Okay? So he works. So he starts the beating. I'm here and keep on. I'm here. And then that knife comes out. And I might be hit once. And it's a, it's a sewing machine motion. So as it's coming in once, twice, and I, I have to do something. I have to divert his thoughts. Okay? I can't reach him here. Okay? I cannot touch him. So what can I hit? So I'm here, bam, I hit him in the groin, and then I track. And then I go into some groundwork or jujitsu. Where I bump and I roll to the side on top, and then I start the beating. From there, I, I do my escape. Okay? There's more involved in that from where I am that you wouldn't be able to see. But that position, I did. Okay? So <laughs> it's always going to start usually with ground and pound like you see in cage fights. The guy beating me, and then all of a sudden, the knife comes out. I have to be able to see that, but I'm not gonna catch it on the first one. I'm not gonna catch it probably on the second one. So I'm going to be stuck. I'm gonna be cut, I'm gonna be stabbed. So then we have to look at the mindset. Because we get stabbed, because we get slashed, does that mean the fight is over? Okay? The mindset to keep fighting and not give up until your last breath is what's gonna is what's going to matter, okay? And to be able to escape and get away. Or take a life if you have to. And can you yeah. show some work with improvised weapon? Sure. Uh, I have a cell phone, okay? I throw the cell phone out, okay? I escape. Yeah. Coffee. I'm not going to throw the coffee out of here. Right. I have a coffee. Hopefully it doesn't come out. But I take it and I throw it. Hot coffee in the space. So I can make some space and be able to run get away. If I'm in an area where I can't necessarily run, maybe there's some chairs. Okay. A chair. If I pull a chair out and start shoving it in his face, the legs of the chair, with him provides what even taking this chair and hitting him with it. Okay? Moving, maybe even getting pinning him against the wall until I can get out of that door open. Okay? So, improvised weapons can, they can work in different ways. I have this room. Okay? Maybe from here, I use it. Okay? The handle, the base of the room, however I can use them. Okay? If you look around in a room, there's always something that you're going to be able to pick up and use. You know, yeah, something is exactly something as simple as I pull some change, some coins out of my pocket, I throw them out in his face, make make him flinch, and be able to to try to make my escape from there. Thank you very much. And can you tell me, please, how do you think is it important to study to learn uh, criminal traditions of the world? I mean, is it going to help with your knife defense? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think if you're interested in learning about the criminal element in the world, that's one thing. Can it help in learning about the, the knife culture? It depends on, on what criminal element you look at and you study. Uh, some criminal elements don't use a blade. Some use firearms, uh, you know. Some, some, you know, and it's 
not always is the edged weapon going to come into play in some of these organizations. So if you're looking to study a criminal group and you're interested in the blade and how it's used, you need to look at that organization and whether they use the blade or not. Okay? That's my opinion. That's mm -hmm. just my, my, my humble opinion on that. How do you think? Who is the most skilled master in the world who has fought against the knife empty-handed? Me. Uh, no. Uh, um, who is the most skilled and has fought against the, the blade? Yes, empty-handed. I, I, I can't answer that. I don't know. I don't know many of these masters that are out there. Uh, and, and what their background is in, in reality on the street. Let's talk, how about Paul Bunak? You know, Paul's a very skilled individual. Um, studied under uh, Guru Dan and Asanto, okay, in, in Kali, Jeet Kune Do. You know, Paul, Paul is a very highly skilled individual. Uh, he's trained some military groups. Um, another individual, that you may want to, to look at, Hank Hayes. Uh, Hank Hayes is a, uh, an individual I just trained with him a few weeks ago up in Virginia. And he trains a lot of military special operations groups. Um, you know, and he's actually invented uh, this knife. This is called the No Lie Blade. And it's felt around the edges. And we take lipstick. Mm -hmm. and we lipstick the edges of the blade and we put white t-shirts on and we'll knife spar and we'll do our knife defense techniques with this blade and the lipstick always shows up no matter what we're doing it'll put a red mark on us just to show us that uh, you will get some type of a cut or a stab when you're messing with somebody with the blade Hank is another guy you may want to talk to. Paul Bunak, very highly skilled guy. Uh, what his street application is, uh, I've heard stories. I can't verify them. Okay, so that's about as far as I can go on that. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Along your school, how do you think which school are effective against the knife attack? And I research other, other schools, other systems. Other people do things, and they may do things similar to what I do. They may do some things completely different than what I do, as far as empty hand versus knife. Uh, is one better than the other? I I haven't done you know I have never trained with the with the other schools around in my area. Uh, I guess you wouldn't be able to know until something happens that you have to use that skill that you learned from that particular school um, you know so it's 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 kind of hard to tell what school is better than others in this in this realm please give some advice to the one who encountered the knife attack on the street and he is empty-handed what he can do if you're on the street make space keep, keep that person away from you if you can escape if you can't escape, put something between you, use improvised weapons. Like I tell people all the time, if somebody's robbing me and they have a knife and they're close enough to me that they can hurt me, I give that person what they want. They want my property, I'll give it to them. I can get it replaced. I can't be replaced if they hurt me and take my life. Okay? So if I can escape, I'm going to run. If I can't, space, put something in between us, improvise weapons. And then if it comes down to it, then if you have a skill level, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to pull the trigger on that skill level and start using it. Otherwise, you're going to have to pray for the best. Thank you very much. And uh, my last question, can you recommend something to the people that just decided to start practicing martial arts or self-defense system? Please understand the difference in what a 
traditional martial arts and a reality-based martial art and a combative art is, okay? Uh, have, have some an objective as to why are you training, okay? Why do I want to learn Taekwondo versus why do I want to learn Kali? Why do I want to learn Taekwondo or Kali versus Krav Maga? Or a reality-based system where we learn everything and then we're put to a test in scenario-based training. Okay? So it's just, it's going to be up to the individual people and their mindset and what's here. Some people, I don't want to learn to fight. I, I, I just want to do it for the art. Okay. No worries, right? Other people, you know, I live in a bad neighborhood. Uh, the world is going crazy right now, so I want to be able to protect myself. So they have to be able to select which ones they want. Do research. Look into the different arts. Look into the different combative styles. And do your research. And make sure that you pick the one you want for what you want to get out of it. Again, with the blade, the blade is a very dangerous instrument. It can go as fast or as slow and in any direction that the handler wants it to go into. If you want to study how to defend yourself against the blade, you have to put your full efforts into it. And just like anything else, if you want to get good, you have to train hard and you have to train often. So. You cannot just do it so-so, okay? You have to study hard, you have to train hard, and you have to understand where you're gonna get bumps and bruises, okay? So that's part of it. So if you decide you want to start to train, select something that's based on what you wanna get out of it, get involved in it, and train hard.